Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. We are going to react to some true crime videos. Don't forget to hit the like button to spread this around to others. And subscribe to watch more videos like this. And now, let's watch. This so-called teacher of the year is now charged with doing the unthinkable to a young student. Brandon Hargrove is a high school teacher from Cluton, Texas. The teacher was arrested back in December 2023 after a former student came forward about historical SA. The former student stated that she had been in a relationship with the teacher from the age of just 15. That is young. Back in 2007 and the SA is alleged to have occurred for two years following this. The student is now in her 30s and is coming to terms obviously with what has happened. She states that the abuse began whilst she was in school, but the pair met off school campus. As a result of the charges, Brandon has been placed on administrative leave from her employer. She's currently charged with six counts of child SA, as well as four counts of indecency with a child by contact, and two counts of indecency with a child by exposure. When I hear stories like this, it's always like the same record playing. It's always the same scenario. And it's crazy. They're so young. The adults, you know, that are not well, really take advantage of people that are not developed enough to know what's going on or have a general idea. I was kidnapped while going to buy a gift for my boyfriend at the store. Here's the video of me entering it. My name is Kelsey Smith, and I was 18 years old. On June 2nd, 2007, I went to the store to surprise my boyfriend for our six-month anniversary. Once inside, I began searching for what I needed, and then called my mother to ask for advice on which wrapping paper to choose for the gift. Little did I know it would be the last time I spoke to her, and that I was being followed by someone who meant me harm. Then, I left the store and didn't make any more contact. My car was found in the parking lot of another store not far from the one I was at, and my lifeless body was found 45 minutes from the store after the police managed to locate my phone. The truth is, that once I left the store, a 26-year-old man named Edwin Roy forced me into his car. The parking lot mm. surveillance cameras recorded everything. Thanks to this, investigators were able to identify him, and it turned out he had a history of violence. They also managed to find this man's fingerprints in the car, and there was no doubt it was him. This man abused me and then killed me, and for that, he was sentenced to life in prison. Do you think his sentence was sufficient? Yeah, I think his life sentence was sufficient. I think he uh, deserved it all too well. Uh, there's a lot of people that complain about having too many cameras out there in public watching you, big brother. But I think it also does some well. I think for the general masses, things like this that pop up from time to time, it gives people a hand in solving brutal cases like this. This is one of the most mysterious missing cases. So he was gonna go cross country skiing in Lake Michigan, right? By himself. And he was known for doing shit like that on his own and stuff. So people didn't really like think too much of it. They didn't really think like, oh, he might die or anything like that, or he might go missing. They were just like, all right, cool. Just let us know when you're back and stuff. <laughs> then the next day, he didn't come back at all. They ended up reporting him missing. The authorities started searching for him and they see a foot trail that shows like him walking in the snow out of nowhere. It just it's like he was what carried from the spot like someone took him or they don't know where the fuck he is and he's missing for like months bro he went missing in february 28th of 1978 out of nowhere may 5th 1979 which is 14 months later steven's parents get a, a ring at the doorbell they open the door it's steven what the fuck what, what was it these past 14 months <laughs> yeah seriously bro. he doesn't remember where he was he doesn't remember like what he was doing for the 14 months what he said he, he remembers is that he was walking his shit started getting like hazy and blurry and oh man out. i don't know where he woke up in a random ass field which was 700 miles away from lake michigan Whoa. and he had different clothes on and he had a different book bag on it's looking like someone fucking took him and like, abducted him yeah because there's no way he did that and he doesn't remember that so apparently like people are seeing him yeah what's up with that uh case um I watched another video explaining that case that he just popped up out of nowhere. Yeah, that is that is crazy. Maybe he got abducted or maybe he had a bad case of schizophrenia. But if you guys have any updates about on this story, drop it in the comments below. Would love to hear about it. My partner threatened to leave me and set an ultimatum. So I killed my own 12-year-old daughter in the hopes of saving our relationship. Wow. 
My name is Penny Boudreaux, and I'm a 34-year-old Canadian woman. After my husband and I divorced, my daughter, named Carissa, chose to live with him. During this time, I met a man named Vernon. A few months later, Carissa expressed a desire to leave her father's home to come and live with me, and I accepted this decision. However, our relationship was sometimes complex, marked by frequent disagreements. Fussed with these recurring arguments, Vernon reached saturation point and presented me with an ultimatum. Either my daughter left, or he would end our relationship. On January 27, 2008, faced with Vernon's ultimatum, I made a tragic decision. I drove Carissa to a secluded spot, pushed her out of the car, tackled her to the ground, and strangled her with a string. What? Back home, I covered up the horror by pretending that Carissa had disappeared after an argument. That evening, I reported her disappearance, but suspicion soon fell on us when neighbors heard us arguing. On February 9th, Carissa's frozen body was discovered in a river, stripped of her jeans, as I had tried to make it look like an assault. Confronted with the evidence, I finally confessed to the crime. For these abominable acts, I was sentenced to life imprisonment, with the possibility of applying for parole after 20 years. Yo, how are you going to do that to your own kid? You couldn't just drop her off somewhere, like in a foster care or something? No, you had a... You had to do all that and like, what is up with people, man? Why was that even an option? Jeez. People who died on live TV and this one is absolutely gut killing. Many of the deaths that we witnessed on live TV are the product of 24 hour news channels because all live news events are completely unwritten. Covering things like hostage crises, attacks and high speed chases are bound to go terribly wrong. And there's no telling when exactly this will happen. That's exactly what led to Fox News having to issue an apology on September 28, 2012. They were covering a high-speed chase in Arizona and even the police backed off when they realized the danger. In place, they opted to plan undercover surveillance and tailed him from the sky in a helicopter. Jodon Romero already had a warrant out for his arrest when he stole an SUV at gunpoint earlier that morning. He weaved through traffic like a madman and sped down commercial areas and ran red lights. When he drove past a group of undercover officers, he opened fire on them through the driver's window. Some believe Jodan had a death wish himself. And finally, after hours, he appeared to have given up. He parked the SUV with the Fox News cameras zooming in on him. At this point, even the on-air reporter expressed concerns. Jodan then took off running and tumbled to the ground. He quickly jumped back to his feet and he was carrying something in his hand. You couldn't tell because of the camera angle, but it was a gun. He then walked towards some shrubbery and immediately unalived himself in the head as hundreds of thousands of people watched. And obviously I can't show the video, but I'll show you a clip leading up to that exact moment. He's not sure about this. He's getting things out of the vehicle, clearly. Uh, it doesn't appear that there's anyone else with him. Well, you know, you wait for the end of these things and then you worry about how they may end. There's nobody else around him. Um, this makes me a little nervous, I gotta tell you. No, get off, 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 get off it, get off it, get off it. Yeah, I don't think I ever experienced or watched um someone offing themselves, especially at the end of a high speed chase. Yeah, I would like to watch that clip, even though it's disturbing, but it's fascinating at the same time. Just because I again had never experienced or witnessed something like that. So that'd be interesting to see. The true story behind this real mugshot is incredibly disturbing. This is Caius Viovis, otherwise known as Roy Gitfinski. I'm going to call him Roy for the rest of the this video. What the heck are those balls on In his forehead? In 2014, Roy was found guilty of murdering and dismembering three local men in Massachusetts. As it turns out, Never Roy seen was a self-proclaimed Satanist and believed he was a vampire with magical powers. According to prosecutors, Roy helped two of his friends kidnap these three men and shoot and kill them. As it turns out, one of Roy's close friends was a Hell's Angel Motorcycle Club member. And one of the victims was set to testify against this Hells Angel member in an assault case in court. But unfortunately, when Roy and his two friends went to murder the witness, he had two friends with him as well. So that meant that Roy and his murder clique had to kill all three of these men. Their names were David Glasser, Edward Frampton, and Robert Chadwell. But this wasn't the first time that Roy had made national headlines for a crime he committed. 
In 1999, he and his then 17-year-old girlfriend had been accused of assault. Apparently, he and his girlfriend had lured a 16-year-old girl back to their hotel room. They had then sliced the girl's back open with a razor blade, oh. licked the blood off from the wound, and what began the... kissing each other. Oh. Police were then called when that 16-year-old girl showed up at a hospital with a 7-inch long gash on her back that required over 30 stitches. And it was back during that trial in the early 2000s when Roy claimed he was a Satanist and a vampire with a thirst for blood. He was then sentenced to 10 years in prison with three years suspended. After he was released, though, and was on parole in 2006, he was arrested again. This time he was arrested for kidnapping and drug possession after he and another male friend held two strippers hostage in a hotel room. The kidnapping charges were later dropped, but he was sent back to prison for violating his probation. Then, just a few years later, he would get entangled in this triple homicide, and he was sentenced to life in prison. When images from Roy's home were shown in court, people were somewhat disturbed. Inside of Roy's house, you can see a lot of black candles, ritualistic knives and items, plenty of skulls and crossbones, witchcraft, occult paraphernalia, and a lot of knives and weapons. Now, after Roy was found guilty for his part in these three murders, he had some choice words to say to the jury. After hearing the verdict, he looked over at the jury and said, I'll see you all in hell. Remember that, every effing one of you, I'll see you all in hell. And this whole story makes me wonder what else Roy did in his life that people don't know about yet. Seriously. Did he have a hand in other crimes? Did he commit other crimes that people don't know about? I don't know. But this story is just flat out disturbing. That is crazy. Man, that guy did some serious drugs. A lot of people do that, though. A lot of mentally ill, sick people think that they're vampires or the devil or they're doing it for Satan. Join the Lopez broadcast. This was some real life analog for me that happened on American TV on January 14, 1989. Channel 5 NBC Chicago. Yeah. They were airing the regular Friday program, showing like a bunch of segments, like PSA segments. Following that would be the U.S. national anthem. And remember, 24 7 TV wasn't a thing during this time. So the TV station would sign off at a certain time, leaving just the color bar screen until the broadcast picked up again in the morning. Instead of it showing like the regular, like it showed a picture instead, it showed a missing person. Instead of it just being for a couple minutes, it was there until the morning. Reminds me of like the Fela Delgado. Yeah. Exactly. Whenever I saw this show, Channel yeah. 5 too, right? Yeah. That's not creepy, bro. What made it more creepy was the fact that how it looks distorted. Now you get a clear picture as it goes over that. Two years later, it happened again, but it was for only a few seconds. Someone was messing with the broadcast. For sure. But that was it. But news journal. They couldn't find shit about him. There was no police reports, nothing. People were coming up with theories, conspiracies. The number, it was connected to the youth department of the Chicago police. I was just about to say we should play the number. Okay, 567, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's going to happen, bro? <laughs> I'm reading my stuff. What? <laughs> People came up with another theory that it's being connected to another person. Who was that person? What was it connected to? So many questions. Have you guys tried calling that number as well? Far one of the worst war videos ever explained. The video that I'm about to explain will shake you to your core and I don't recommend looking it up. The video depicts the execution of a so-called Russian spy by a Ukrainian soldier. This video is said to be from the early months of the Russian and Ukraine war. The victim in the video was allegedly a Ukrainian man feeding information to Russian forces, but there isn't any concrete proof of this. The video itself is short and it's around one minute long. It appears to be recorded in a apartment block on a staircase. As you play the video, you see a soldier and his captive kneeling in front of one another and the captive has a bag over his head. The soldier takes the bag off and he then takes a knife that looks like a bayonet and he then pushes the victim's head back against the wall and then drives the blade into the victim's left eye socket. He pushes the blade in as the victim grimaces in pain. He then pushes the victim to the ground so that he has better leverage he then uses his palm to essentially hammer the blade deeper into the victim's eye socket. Yikes. The victim is still somehow alive, but he still hasn't made a sound. The killer then takes the handle of the blade and appears to shake it or pull it out, and at this point, the victim lets out a scream that you can't describe. He wails in pain as the sound echoes I would too. the apartment block. The screams are honestly borderline traumatizing. The killer continues to jiggle the blade, and the screams turn even worse. 
At this mm. point, the killer resumes using his palm to hammer the blade deeper into the victim's head. He hits the blade handle twice, each time pushing the blade a centimeter deeper into the eye socket. Mm. Mm. And mm. on the second palm strike, the victim stops making noises and it appears he goes limp. It seems he drove the knife through the victim's eye and into his prefrontal cortex. The video is luckily hard to find and it seems to have been wiped from the internet and no mainstream networks ever covered it despite it being an obvious war crime. I don't recommend even trying to search it. There's no point and you are better off staying curious. This video is absolutely awful. Just by him saying that makes me even more curious. This is the most notorious priest in all of Australia, Bernard McGrath. And because people roast me for this, he is considered to be the most notorious offender in the most notorious religious order in Australia. And yes, he's a pedophile, of course. Bernard was born in 1947 in Christchurch, New Zealand. And his father was a butcher who was previously involved with the church and wanted his son to live a life according to God and be involved with the church himself. So in 1968, Bernard took his vows. And in early 1969, he became a scholastic and worked in psychiatric wards. Keep in mind, he had taken a vow of chastity, but he reported that during his time here, he had a sexual relationship with another man, a fellow priest named Brother Berkman's Moynihan. So in 1974, he was transferred to the Maryland School in Christchurch. Prior at the school was Brother Roger Maloney. And apparently in his years at the school, Roger had fostered an environment of sexual abuse and terror. Roger Maloney would eventually be convicted of child sex abuse, but he allegedly forced Bernard to perform sex acts on him just to keep his job. But even though written complaints were made about Roger and Bernard, nothing happened. And Roger was eventually transferred to the Vatican to work as a pharmacist. And after sexually abusing kids at this school, Bernard was transferred to another school for disadvantaged kids. Wow. By the way, this is a picture of Bernard and Roger, if you were wondering. So in 1981, the Bernard repercussions are real. A named Kendall Grange. And it was here where he had access to hundreds of disadvantaged boys who lived there on property. And he sexually abused a majority of these young boys. Parents made complaints that they heard that the headmaster was touching their children, but nothing was ever done about this. In 1992, however, Bernard was brought to a meeting with Father Brian Lucas. At the time, a lot of people had been reporting that priests and brothers had been touching children inside of churches, so Lucas was kind of the figurehead for the church's response, and he was trying to remediate all these actions. And when Bernard met with him, he said that there would be a lot of allegations coming out against him, and so he was sent to a rehabilitation center in America. But then in 1993, legal troubles began for Bernard. All of his victims began to come forward, and he was in prison for a number of years. This would be his first of five different trials that he was involved with that lasted from 1993 all the way up to 2019. And in total, he would be sentenced to about 68 years in prison for over 100 counts of abuse against boys. Obviously, he abused hundreds of children, but these were just the accounts that they could prove. And some of these accounts of the abuse are absolutely horrific. I can't read them here on TikTok, but he did terrible, terrible things to these young children. So Bernard was a part of the St. John of God order, and there were a ton of different members of this order that were eventually... He looks like a hardcore pedophile. I mean, take a look here. These are just a few of the members that were convicted eventually as well. But one of the most shocking things about this case is the cover-up. So as far back as 1977, people were reporting that Bernard was touching children in these schools. And even though this was brought up to many people in powerful positions, they always transferred Bernard... Attempted to silence parents and other people that were reporting this. Trying to brush it under the yeah, rug. Never reported him to police. Thank God, though, that now he's in prison. A real man of God. I like that ending. <laughs> a real man of God. During those times, man, scenarios like that were coming out, especially in the church. The most sacred of places. I wonder if he's still in prison. Is he still alive? Do you guys know? I guess I got to look it up myself. If not, feel free to drop a comment. This man butchered his parents and then boiled his mother's head on the stove. Joel Guy Jr., 28, was studying to become a plastic surgeon in Tennessee. He'd always been supported by his parents and he'd never worked. But they were due to retire and they told Joel that he'd have to get a job because they couldn't afford for him to live off them anymore. But Joel didn't like this idea, so he decided to get rid of them and live off his inheritance instead. On November 7th, 2016, Joel bought acid, hydrogen peroxide, a knife, a bleach sprayer, and a big plastic tote, big enough to fit a human body in. Three weeks later, he put his murderous plan into action. While his mother Lisa was out buying groceries, Joel Jr. attacked his father, Joel Sr. He stabbed him with the knife over 40 times. There was a huge struggle. 
and Joel Jr. actually received some cuts to his hands. His father literally fought for his life, but succumbed to his injuries. When Lisa returned home, she too was attacked with a knife and stabbed over 30 times. With his parents now dead, Joel set about dismembering their bodies. He removed his father's hands at the wrists and then placed them on the floor. He then removed Lisa's head, carried it mm. downstairs, and placed it in this pot on the stove. Joel Sr. and Lisa had both had their limbs disarticulated. Joel at the waist and Lisa at the knees. Joel had then placed the bodies into this blue toast and filled it with acid. He'd inflicted two large incisions to each body to allow the acid to seep in faster. Joel then calmly drove back to university to have his wounds treated at the student clinic. Lisa obviously didn't turn up for work the next day and her boss couldn't get hold of her, so she asked police to do a welfare check. What they were greeted with was like something out of a horror movie. I've seen the pictures and this crime scene was absolutely horrific. They could smell the chemicals before they even went into the house and the heating had been turned up full. As they walked through the house, their skin started to tingle with the strength of the chemicals. When they got upstairs, they saw a pair of severed hands on the floor and a bathtub covered in blood. They then discovered That's the brutal. soaked bodies and Lisa's head boiling on the stove. Joel Jr. was placed under surveillance for a few days and the police found a meat grinder in his car. He was arrested and charged with double capital murder. He was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. He's currently incarcerated in Tiptonville, Tennessee. I had to take a long breath in because that is the saddest, worst, tragic story I've heard of yet. I can't believe that guy did that, dude. Why don't you own up? Get a job somewhere. Do whatever it takes. Some people just give up way too fast. Overall, should not even be an ultimatum or an option to do that to your own parents. Your own parents, dude. Sad. Sad, sad, sad. Well, guys, that is the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching these videos with me and hanging out. Let me know in the comments what are your guys' thoughts on these videos. You guys are awesome, and I appreciate each and every one of you. And as always, I will see you on the next one. Peace. Hey guys, if you like this type of content, make sure to check out these videos. See ya.